All right, Alexander, let's talk about the July 4th elections that are going to take place in the UK. What uh, what are your thoughts about the announcement of these elections? Sunak gave a short but interesting uh, eight-minute speech full of lies, full of a lot of lies. And uh, we have the possible prime ministership of Keir Starmer on the way, possible, unless something changes drastically in in the next uh, few weeks. So elections, interesting day to, to have elections, huh? July 4th. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I, I am sure that is coincidence that it's America's national day. I'm <laughs> sure that isn't what the... Uh, British were thinking about or why Sunak was thinking about. The first thing to say is that a lot of the media commentators, and it seems a lot of the Conservative MPs were blindsided by this decision. They were expecting an election in the in November or um, around November time, not as soon as this. And they're all incredulous that it's been called at this time. And the... Um, media classes talking about this as a big gamble on Sunak's part. Um, I have to say, you mentioned his speech in the pouring rain in London. I thought it was a dismal start uh, for an election campaign. Neither Sunak nor Starmer are experienced um, election campaigners. So that's going to be already an interesting fact. I mean, you know, most British prime ministers, by the time they become prime ministers know how to fight elections. Neither Sunak nor Starmer do. They've no experience of this, no background in doing anything like this. So we'll see how it turns out. Already, the opinion polls are saying, telling us two things. One, that we can predict a simply gigantic Labour landslide and a complete conservative collapse. And secondly, that they don't expect any kind of change in this election and that there is no enthusiasm for either of the two main parties or either of the two main candidates, Sunak and Starmer, neither of whom is unpopular. So the big question everybody is asking is why did Sunak call the election now? And actually, I think there is an extremely simple answer to this. And it goes back to our last programme about British politics when we discussed the British regional elections, the local elections, which took place um, earlier earlier in May, earlier this month. The reason is that neither party is popular and both parties, both Labour and Conservative, face the prospect or, or risk the prospect that if they delay the election until the autumn, um, other parties to the right and to the left of them will start to organise and will start to bleed votes, to take away votes from the two main parties. And the result is we could have a situation where the entire election changes and where, who knows, perhaps these other parties, Reform UK on the right, a more amorphous collection of parties on the left, but maybe... Um, Maybe the Workers' Party that George Galloway is trying to pull together. Maybe the Greens, who look strong in places like Bristol. Bristol is um, the British equivalent of San Francisco, I should say. Its politics are very similar to that. Anyway, the fear the British establishment, both Conservative and Labour, and if you like, the Uber establishment, the part of the establishment that we don't see, but which is the ultimately the dominant force has, is that if they leave the election too long, these other parties, which are still a work in progress, will organise and that that will, in effect, provide them with an opportunity, maybe to enter the House of Commons, maybe to determine the election outcome. So the imperative became, after the local elections, hold the election as quickly as possible There'll be a, probably a low turnout, but you get a big, solid Labour majority. The Conservatives go down, but they remain the second biggest party. 
you maintain control of the House of Commons and of the political system. And again, you don't allow the real parties, if you like, the real opposition on the left and the right to uh, to enter into politics. So if you accept the reality that Sunak is a uniparty figure, and you accept the reality that Starmer is also a uniparty figure, then calling the election now makes complete sense. And it is the uniparty collectively that has made the decision to call the election now. Yeah, a, a uniparty decision. I was just about to say the same thing. It sounds like they got together and they decided, OK, now's, now's the best time to have this election to benefit you guys as well as us, Labour and Conservatives. So let's uh, let's slate it in there for July 4th. But what does it really accomplish? OK, you're just delaying the inevitable, right? I mean, is well, Keir Starmer you? going to do that? Is Keir Starmer going to do that good of a job? No, he's going to be worse well, he's than. Not. He's going to be worse than Sunak. He's <laughs> so not. I mean, it's he's people. Not. People no. get, people hate the conservatives. With Starmer, they're going to end up hating the hating Labour like they hate the conservatives. And once again, you open up a, a pathway later down the line for maybe maybe for a, a new party or a new candidate to to rise. But who, who knows if if one of these yeah, well, these candidates is out there. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, there is a comparison. Of course, I'm sorry if, you know, I'm going to go a bit down, down the road, British history. But there's been an interesting article in the Daily Telegraph, which talks about the election of 1906, which was in some ways a not dissimilar election. Conservatives have been in power for a very long time. They'd become very, very unpopular indeed. They, they were divided over many things, tariff reform specifically. Um, and what basically happened is that though neither conservatives, neither the conservatives nor their main opponents at that time, who were the liberals, were particularly popular, an election was called and the liberals won with the biggest landslide that there has ever been in British electoral history. I mean, it was an absolute smash. And very quickly, the liberals also became unpopular. And within about 10, 15 years, the Liberal Party collapsed and was replaced by the Labour Party. And some people are saying that this is the same kind of election that we're going to have this time, that we're going to have a uh, conservative route. I don't think anybody doubts that. And there's even some people who think the Conservatives might fall below 100 seats, which, well, I, I still find difficult to believe, but we'll see. But a conservative route... Um, a Labour landslide, Labour unpopular, but then new forces will emerge either to the left or to the right. As you say, you're kicking the can down the road and there will be an election in the future when everything changes and we, these new parties are formed and, they, and the big parties are replaced by them. I have to say I'm not so sure and I'll tell you why. In 1906, we had a completely different British political scene, a completely different political class, the old establishment, whatever you may think of them, they were committed to the British constitution, they were committed to proper elections or you know, elections being conducted in a proper way. They did not have the authoritarian instincts of the political class today. I have to say this, I, I think much more likely at least the plan of the Uniparty, of the British establishment, is get yourself a big Labour government, a big uh, Labour government with a very big majority, read by some very tough hardline figures, and um, you then pass all kinds of um, laws, and they're already being prepared, restricting protests, doing all kinds of things, and basically you make it impossible for rival parties to organise themselves. So I think this is much more likely what is happening, that we're going to see a uh, continued immobil immobilism within the political system, um, um, an increasingly authoritarian turn inside Britain itself. And of course, you're absolutely correct about one thing, no real answers to any of the problems that Britain is facing. I mean, I've never known a time when 
both of the major parties are coming to an election with no programme at all. I mean, there is no programme either from the Conservatives or from the Labour Party. Um, we have administration instead of government. But I, I have a fear, actually, that that is going to be our future for an indefinite period of time. I, I'm not sure that this system that's now established itself is going to be broken very easily. Just saying. Maybe that's the plan. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think uh, it is. Makes sense. It makes sense. And, and and it's great because you can, if you're the, the UK, you can uh, talk about uh, democracy and talk about how Russia and China and, and Iran are trying to take away our democracy and they're attacking our democracy. While at the same time, you you destroy, you erode, erode away at your democracy and you become authoritarian and you create this this administrative government and, and you point fingers at at the other authoritarians. That's, that's what you label them. They're the authoritarians. We're the we're the democracy. We're the we're the, we're the free world. And you know, people people are focused on on those guys while at home everything is being uh, dismantled into this this administrative government system. It makes, it makes yeah, sense, I, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. I, well, I think that is the plan. I mean, I should say that I think people are utterly cynical and can see through it. I think that, you know, back in 2022, when there was the start of the Ukraine war, a lot of people got very worked up about it in Britain, took it seriously, believed in a lot of what they were said. I think that's drained away, actually. And I think uh, people are becoming impatient with a political class that is simply not interested in their concerns. And we're having a whole succession of scandals. We've had a succession, a, a scandal over the British Post Office, when all sorts of people were um, in, you know, charged with all kinds of crimes of embezzlement from the Post Office. And it turned out that none of that was true. And all of these people were innocent. And it was all the fault of a computer system that had been established by the Post Office. And it was all concealed by the leadership of the post office, who were, as nobody, by the way, ever says, piloting the post office at the time towards privatisation, from which they all stood to benefit personally very much. Just saying, I mean, this isn't a side of the story that people talk about. And we've had the uh, um, a another scandal involving infected blood, which goes all the way back to the 1980s, which appears also to have been massively covered up and all kinds of things like that. And, covered up, not just for years, but for decades. And that affects the National Health Service. Both of these scandals tell us things about the quality of British governance today. More and more people are aware of this. As I said, there is disillusion and there is increasing cynicism. But I don't get the sense at the moment that this has come together, that there's a critical mass of people prepared to challenge the uniparty head on. So, yes, there are parties to the left and there are parties to the right. But I think if they can be knocked out of the system, which is what we are seeing them trying to do, then I think the uniparty will, for the moment, retain control, just as they succeeded, basically, in sidelining, in, in basically uh, sidelining Corbyn. And just as, in the end, they succeeded in uh, uh, dismantling Brexit, which is what most people voted for. And I think Brexit is the, is the issue because this is a massive issue. People voted for it. There was intense emotion and passion around it. But despite a referendum in 2016, despite a Conservative victory in 2019, which is all about getting Brexit done, despite all of that, we're basically back where we started. And I think that has taken away a lot of the faith in politics that many people had. So people have, for the moment, they've withdrawn, they've gone back into their lives. They're utterly cynical about politics, but they're not yet angry enough or desperate enough to do much about it. That's my own sense about the mood in Britain today.
Yeah. So you got to clamp down on the people before something happens unforeseen, like the rise of, of, of a Fizzo and Orban, uh, Putin, a Trump, whatever. Left, right, whatever you may think of all of these people, the, that's the last thing you want to see happen. Someone like that rise yep. to, to, to the forefront and, and gain momentum. And then, then you've got political problems if you're the establishment. So, yeah, you got, you got to nip all of this in the bud. You got to do it Exactly. Now. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why you have an election now. Um, of course, the fate of Britain as a whole is a dismal one, because as has become absolutely obvious, not just in Britain, but in Europe, to some extent, even in the United States, the, the, the people who are in charge now have no interest in the problems that um, really affect um, Britain. They've got no real plan of how to change things round. Um, you see this in their manifestos. We haven't yet had the manifestos. But there's no programme of action, no real idea of what to do. And so, I mean, decline, <laughs> gradual decline, things are going to continue to slip backwards. <laughs> no real programme about how to take things forward. It is ultimately unsustainable but it could last a long time. And that's, in some ways, the worst possible fate that can await a country. Well, there is a program, just to wrap up the video, there is a program that not only the UK has, but I think much of Europe is implementing. And it is an economic pro program. It's a, it's a defense program, and that is to ramp up for a possible uh, five or 10 year war with, with Russia, five or 10 years in the distance. I mean, so, so they're, they're ramping up now. And they're allocating money and and uh, and resources to prepare for this smash with Russia that's going to take place in, in five or ten years. I believe Shaps actually said in five years. So Britain has to start building up its military now. So I mean, there is a program, and there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of the establishment of and the MIC companies. Yeah, but there's a know, lot of, the, the, the people lot of, are, the people aren't going to see any of it. That's for sure. There's, there's a lot of talk about this. There's, as you say, a lot of money. The truth, we haven't yet seen it. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about increasing the proportion of GDP that Britain allocates to defence, but not really much sign of that happening so far. Um, Sunak talks about it, but I don't know how far anybody believes him. But of course, again, as we've seen time and again, money can be found for these things. Translating that money into actual military equipment is a completely different matter. And um, given that we are in the early stages of a major budgetary and debt crisis in Britain, I wonder whether that's really actually going to um, work very well going forward. We're not the United States. We can't just print money indefinitely in the way that the United States has been able to do. So it might not be actually much of a policy in Britain either. I, I, I get to say, it, I think what we'll probably see in Britain is a gradual, steady decline in every aspect of public life, that which we've been seeing for a long time, a British economy that is losing its positions, the City of London no longer the force that it was in international finance, for example. Um, all of that, all carrying on. Life, for many people, will remain very pleasant, it's a rich country. It's got lots of accumulated wealth and resources. But as I say, a slow, gradual decline. I think that is where we are. As I said, projects to the right and projects to the left have all been shut off. Um, and, of course, change to foreign policy, absolutely no way. No one who has any ideas about how to look again at Britain's foreign policy and try to get us into a better position than the one we're in at the moment. Uh, again, all of those people shut out of the system and um, not just um, not just marginalised, but, um, you know, ridiculed and mocked and abused as well. So this election, Farage, for example, out in the wilderness. Corbyn also out in the wilderness. He's trying to stand as an independent MP. Yeah, well, foreign policy has been outsourced to the United States, so 
<laughs> They've outsourced foreign that. policy. One less, foreign policy. One less decision outsourced. that they have to make. <laughs> yeah. Foreign policy has been outsourced to the neocons in the United States, well, and yeah. their great terror is an administration in the United States which is not part of the neocon system, because if their friends in Washington lose power, then they're in a very difficult hole indeed. Which is one of the reasons they're so. Uh, involved in U.S. politics at this time. Just so. Yeah, well, well, I think the neocons have a much stronger hold on the U.K. than they do in the, on the U.S. That's just my I agree. Much. So even, even if the neocon power diminishes in the U.S., I think their hold oh, on the I U.K. Is, agree with is that. rock solid. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. All right, we will uh, end the video there, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop, 15% off merch. Use the code, get ready, 15. Take care.